Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Be Curious Lakes event. Um, tonight's theme is cotton, unpicking the stories woven into our clothes. Um, a live transcript is available for this event. Uh, the link will be provided in the chat now. Click this to follow along with us as we go. So my name is Dr. Matthew Davis. Uh, I'll be your host for tonight. Um, I'm an associate professor here in the business school at the University of Leeds. And one of the areas that I work on is corporate social responsibility, and in particular, working with colleagues in the School of Design and elsewhere um, on the issue of sustainability um, and, uh, and worker welfare in the fashion industry. If you've joined uh, one of our previous LATES events, welcome back. If this is your first LATES, welcome for the first time. In each of our LATES events, we invite you to take a peek at what goes on inside a university with help from the University of Leeds researchers and the partners they work with. Now, our speakers are connected by a theme, and tonight is all about the cotton industry. You may not know, but cotton goes through a complex production process and is touched by many different hands in the supply chain before it's transformed into the clothes that we eventually wear. Tonight, we'll be exploring the global importance of cotton, its history, and influence on the fashion industry itself. We'll also have a think about the contested history from both the UK and the Indian perspectives. Now, each speaker will give you their take on the theme. After that, we'll be inviting questions from you. If you have a question for the speaker, just post it in the chat, which you should see to the right if you're viewing the event on YouTube. To participate in the live chat, you'll be required to sign into YouTube using a Google account. If you'd rather not log in and you're happy just to watch along, that's perfectly fine too, um, but you do need to log in if you want to ask a question. Now, our moderator team will be keeping an eye on the chat um, and would love to say hello to some of you this evening. So let's give the chat a try now. Give us a big hello and let us know where you're tuning in from uh, in the world. And let's just check that, uh, that it's all working and we can say hello on the chat as well as on screen. Excellent. So we've got the, the chat is working um, and it's reassuring to see that it's snowing in Scotland um, as well as just in, in Sheffield and Leeds um, here in Yorkshire. So tonight, I'm really pleased to say we're joined by two speakers. So we've got Dr. Beth and Bide and Sidan Shah. Now, unfortunately, Vanessa Jones from Leeds, you know, Leeds Museums and Galleries um, is unable to join us um, this evening, but we have included her contributions in tonight's talk. So we are going to have some of her contributions. Unfortunately, uh, Vanessa couldn't join live though. So I'm delighted to say, um, knowing that the uh, the chat is definitely working, so we're able to interact. You're able to ask us questions. Um, we can have a bit of to and, uh, to and fro as we go through. Um, but it's time to move on to our first speaker and to get the event moving. So first off um, to talk this evening, is Dr. Bethan Bide. So Bethan is a lecturer in design and cultural theory at the University of Leeds. Uh, Bethan's interests, uh, research interests center around the cultural, social and business histories of fashion. So really, really on topic for tonight. And in particular, one of the things that Bethan looks at is the role that fashion plays in museums. And she's collaborated extensively with museum curators and most recently on a project about Jewish fas fashion with the Museum of London. Um, I'm also working with uh, Bethan at the moment on an AHRC funded project, um, along with Sidang as, uh, as well, um, and we'll talk about this as we get into the discussion, but really pleased uh, to have this. Now, Bethan's uh, talk this evening um, will uh, we'll focus on, on a number of things, and I know she's got some great images to show you uh, from some collections, um, but in particular, going to be thinking about um, how cotton has formed a really integral part of what's considered British fashion for several hundred years now. Now, I'm not going to tell you anymore because Bethan has got plenty of really interesting things to share. Um, and with that, I shall pass over. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your talk, Bethan. Thank you, Matt. That's uh, fantastic. So as Matt said, I'm going to be focusing this evening on giving you a bit of a kind of speed run through of some of the ways that cotton and British fashion have been intertwined over the last couple of hundred years. Because many of the, the most iconic looks that people think about 
when they think of British fashion, are made of cotton. And that uh, ranges from the types of Regency dresses that you see in Jane Austen adaptations, right the way through to the clothes worn by the British royal family. And you can see here on the screen um, a great image of the royal princesses on tour of the Commonwealth in 1947 wearing cotton outfits. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these outfits later on. But the, the use of cotton in British fashion makes us ask some really interesting questions about what British fashion is, about where the borders of British fashion lie and about how British fashion interacts with the world. And this is perhaps unsurprising because, of course, the borders of Britain have also changed over the centuries that we're going to be talking about as the British Empire and British territories have grown and shrunk. So I'm just going to take you through some of the ways that the production and consumption of cotton um, are involved in the story of what is British fashion? What do we understand to be British? And how does that connect to global networks, global trade and global industry? I'm also going to be touching a little bit on perhaps the, the long history that British consumers have of not really interrogating where the cotton that makes their clothes comes from. Um, so, as we said, cotton is something that uh, is integral to British fashion, but we don't grow cotton in Britain. Um, that is because our climate in Britain is wrong for cotton. We are too cold for cotton. Um, and cotton has been imported to Britain for a long period of time. It's first imported in the 16th century, but it's not really until the mid 18th century that cotton becomes absolutely integral in everyday clothes and in the fashion industry. And that's because imports of raw cotton from areas like the West Indies um, become really important and uh, there's an enormous amount of imported cotton that is enabled by uh, Britain's imperial trade links that are growing during the 18th century. Um, and this leads to a sort of surge in popularity of cotton and cotton fashions. Um, and the surge in popularity creates some really interesting connections between different parts of the world. So on the screen, you can see two black and white um, uh, etchings um, that show very different parts of the cotton production process in very different places. So on the left hand side of the screen, you can see um, some very early cotton processing. So this is the very first processing that's done of the raw cotton. Um, and it's being done by enslaved people in North America. So um, the slave trade is enormously important for the cotton industry and this boom in the popularity of, of cotton around this time. But the other part of the story um, in terms of what's making British cotton is not just the ability to import all of this raw cotton, it's also the ability to process it. So if you look over to the right hand side of the screen, you can see this image of a cotton mill. Um, and what we can see here is the kind of impact of the Industrial Revolution. So there are lots of technological developments in the 18th century that enable uh, British producers to make cotton fast and cheap. So that includes things like in 1733, the invention of the flying shuttle by John Kay and James Hargreaves' uh, invention of the spinning jenny. And all of these technological developments enable that raw cotton that's being imported um, from uh, plantations, it's being imported from the West Indies and North America to be processed and produced into inexpensive cotton cloth in Britain. Um, and this network of global trade and technology 
mean that Britain become a real centre for the production of cotton. Um, and by the late 1700s, we know that cotton accounts for around 16% of all of Britain's exports. So it's really economically significant. But by the early 1800s, so just a few decades later, this is multiplied to around 42%. So by the early 1800s, a little less than half of all of Britain's exports are cotton. So this global network, these connections to the slave trade um, and these connections to um, other countries where it can import this raw cotton from are vital for this economic growth. Um, I think this makes us ask questions about uh, who is involved in the production of cotton. Um, because in Britain, the enormous growth of inexpensive cotton was fantastically important for making fashions much more accessible to people. So if you can produce cheap printed cotton fabrics, um, you can have many more clothes, you can wear more fashions, you can change your clothes more regularly. So for many people in Britain, the boom in the cotton industry was not only important for their jobs, but it was also important for the way that they were expressing themselves for how they were able to use fashion. And it wasn't really um, until the late 18th and early 19th century that people started to ask more questions about where this cotton came from. Um, they started to ask who was farming this cotton? Um, and they started to really interrogate the ethics of what it meant to have this cotton industry that was really relying on enslaved labor. And what we see is a really interesting kind of backlash from some people. So um, there's a really interesting connection in terms of consumer power that we see around this time. So uh, what's often discussed um, in the early 19th century, particularly during the, 1940, uh, the 1840s and 1850s, is the activism around sugar and sugar boycotts. Um, so people saying that they don't want to boycott sugar that's been produced by enslaved people. But that's also happening to a lesser extent in terms of cotton, particularly led uh, by Quakers. And this wonderful image here shows um, some British Quakers who were involved in the cotton boycott of the 1850s. Um, and you can see here uh, the family of um, Ellen, Eleanor Stephen Clark, who ran a free labor cotton depot, which is a sort of small shop uh, where she sold um, cotton goods that had been produced by free people. Um, and you can see it's quite interesting to note that these are quite visually distinctive fashions. So they're not trying to emulate the kind of cotton garments that are being produced uh, by perhaps the big mills that are relying on cotton produced by enslaved people. They're trying to visually distinguish themselves. They're showing that these free cotton fashions look a little bit different. So we can see here a really interesting example of the fact that not only has British fashion got this long connection with different parts of the world. But also British cotton fashions have a long connection with consumer activism as well. And this is something I wanted to mention because the importance of Britain's empire and its global trade networks weren't just something that mattered for the production of cotton and the transference of raw materials but they were also really important for shaping British fashion design. And I'm going to turn here to the example of muslin. Um, and this is a muslin dress um, on the screen um, and a, an example of another muslin piece of cloth. And both of these are from the Victoria and Albert Museum's connections. Um, and muslin is a really interesting example of how Britain's global uh, trading networks shaped British fashion. 
So you can see that these types of garments, which became popular around the end of the 18th century, the start of the 19th century, the Regency period in England um, and the UK, um, they are really sort of loose fitting and flowing and they replace some of the more rigidly tailored garments that had been fashionable before this. Um, and they are inspired by the kind of statuary of ancient Greece and Rome, and they're epitomized by, by this really lightweight flowing fabric. And I think what's really interesting about this style of fashion is that it's made possible by the new imports of uh, muslin fabrics um, uh, like that come from places like Bengal and these types of fabrics were not being produced in the UK they weren't really known um, in the UK around this time so it wasn't until they were imported that these fashionable styles could develop because we just didn't have the fabrics to make them so I think it's really interesting to think about this very quintessential British look actually being enabled um, by uh, import and export um, between Britain and India. Um, this isn't the first time that Indian production skills influence British fashion. Um, if we look back to the 18th century, Indian chintz became extremely fashionable across Europe. Um, and what's really interesting when we look at the popularity of Indian chintz, so this very uh, striking floral patterns, um, is that what we see is that Indian makers start to adapt designs specifically for the export market. So we see that not only are British fashions being shaped by Indian designs in terms of the chintz, but we also see that chintz makers in India are adapting what they're making for the export market. So we see this real exchange of design ideas. So we can really see the importance in terms of shaping what we understand to be British design here. Um, and that's something that doesn't end um, with the end of, of the British Empire. That's something that kind of continues this importance of, um, of, of, I suppose, the importance of Britain's connections to the world. Um, through cotton in terms of shaping what makes British design is something that continues throughout the 20th century. Um, so we're going to jump forward now, just talk a little bit about the 20th century. Um, because during the 20th century, Britain rises on the international stage to become a really significant player in the fashion industry. It becomes renowned as being a centre for fashion. And um, Cotton enables it to do that. Cotton is something that is um, a really important part of what Britain becomes known for producing. So I want to just talk a little bit about Horrocks's. Um, so Horrocks's fashions were established in 1946 by uh, Cruzen and Co. Um, and this was a well-established cotton manufacturer. They'd been formed in 1791. But in 1946, they recognised they need to diversify from just making cotton cloth in order to sell more goods. So they diversified into making fashions. Uh, and you can see here some lovely examples of the types of brightly colored, fashionable clothes that they made. Um, and Horrocks's uh, made those dresses that you saw on the Royal Princess in my first slide. So Horrocks's cottons were really championed as a British export and they were enormously successful on the global stage. Um, and you can see on this, uh, on the, the image on the right hand side here, it says such lovely cottons could only come from England. And I find that very interesting, the idea that, of course, the raw cotton is still being imported. There is still this international network that's enabling the production of this English cotton. But cotton has become very synonymous with this English fashion. And finally, I wanted to finish up by just thinking about how the boundaries of British cotton um, have shifted uh, alongside Britain's changing geographical boundaries under, under empire. But this isn't just about raw cotton. It's also 
about design and it's also fed back. So Anthea McNish is a really interesting example of this. Uh, McNish was born in Trinidad and moved to London in 1951, uh, where she became a textile designer. And she worked for companies like Liberty & Co. Uh, and she designed fabrics for the Queen when she visited Trinidad. Um, and amongst the fabrics she designed, she designed it cottons. And she drew on her Trinidadian background to create her designs. And I just wanted to finish up by noting, uh, if you look at the, you can't quite make it out, but you see some text on the edge of that um, cotton sample there uh, that says woven and printed in England. And you can really see the kind of patriotism of the post-war by British movement there. But I think this piece of cloth really challenges us to think about what does it mean to say that this design is a British fashion because it relies on connections between places that are producing raw cotton, but also Trinidadian design culture um, and uh, design culture over here in Britain. So I think I just wanted to finish up by pointing out that the idea that um, cotton has been so important to the development of British fashion, makes us look again about the connections that British fashion has with the rest of the world and how those connections have enabled the British fashion industry to grow in the way it has. Um, thank you very much. That was, as I said, a, a very quick dive in, but I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this. Thank you, Beth. And that, that was excellent. Really interesting. And it's made me think uh, about the journey and, and the development of, of, of cotton um, in the industry. And I think that that picture um, of the, with the, the Muslim dress and, and what have you, um, I wouldn't have thought that uh, that we didn't have the fabric before that. So it's great. Thank you very much. Um, and, um, and we've got a couple of questions and, and comments that have come in um, as you were talking as well, which I'd like to start us off with. Um, and a um, a a a comment and a question from Liv, uh, who said that it's um, it's interesting that Indian styles both influenced and were adapted for British tastes. Are there any examples of that happening with today's trends, or is it is the industry more geared towards British wants and desires? I guess and, and uh, trends. It's a really interesting question because I think we when we think about what fashion is today, obviously fashion in some ways is so global um, that there's often a lot of discussion about the fact that do we really have a very kind of British sense of what dress is anymore? Um, but I do think that there's some important uh, questions to ask about the way that um, the British fashion industry, the Brit British cotton industry, pretty much decimated uh, a lot of the Indian cotton industry in the 19th century by uh, stealing designs and sort of producing it cheaper and easier. But there's been a, a sort of backlash in, in recent years, um, not backlash, but a resurgence, um, I know, in terms of Indian cotton production um, and textile production, and something Siddhant might mention a little bit as well. But I think there's a very interesting kind of pushback to say, actually, um, maybe these international uh, differences are something that we should be celebrating more in terms of the fashion industry. Maybe we shouldn't all be wearing the same things. Maybe actually um, fashion gets more interesting when we when we explore our differences. I think diversity is always something to be celebrated, isn't it? And um, I, I guess we're kind of linking on in terms of thinking about um, fashion today as well. There's a really interesting comment by Jane um, making the, I think, really valid point that we still need to ask questions about textile production as well as the fast fashion industry and often we we leap to think about fast fashion um when we when we talk about uh, potential problems it might be in the industry um but especially when we think about our making the present day is somehow more wholesome or green and everything is much better now than it was looking back historically um so maybe not just thinking fast fashion i think you you there's many problems across the industry potentially um but what's your take on this um i think it's a really it's a really good question and one of the one of the things that um, you often see when you look at historic cotton 
garments is that the cotton was valued enough that it was made and remade. So a lot of historic chintzes, um, particularly because the cotton, um, the fabric was very good quality, so you could remake the garment. And you see a lot of 18th century garments that have been remade into 19th century garments and later. So I think um, thinking about the ways that these fabrics were valued and recycled is really interesting for us today in terms of thinking about value. Um, and I think it makes us, as you said, think again about the fact that um, somehow everything is kind of better today. Um, I think one of the things that I'm always interested in is thinking about consumer pressure in the historical period as well, because I think we often think that people just accepted that enslaved people were producing goods and people just accepted that children were working in mills in terrible conditions. And of course, when you look, there's an awful lot of consumer pushback um, and a lot of pressure from people saying that actually this is not okay. We want our, we want our clothes and our cotton to be ethically made. Um, and that's, you know, said something that's got a long history as well. So I think thinking about the history of consumer pressure for more ethically produced uh, textiles is really interesting. Well, that's good. I'm pleased you, you said that, Beth, because the question that I was going to ask you was uh, when you mentioned earlier on about the um, the anti-slavery movement and, and uh, the, um, the popular movement against this with cotton production, were people questioning the, the production of garments and, and fabrics in the UK as well? Were they concerned with the, the work conditions for people um, involved in the local production also? Um, they were. Um, it's, so the, the cotton industry uh, was actually quite significant in terms of pr putting pressure uh, on uh, the American on in North America to end slavery. So there's a big cotton boycott in Lancashire, um, sort of in support of ending slavery. They say we're not going to take this raw cotton from North America anymore until you um, end slavery. And this caused a huge amount of economic hardship in Lancashire, um, which is very reliant on cotton mills. So it's very interesting to see if you look at newspapers around that time and the way people are discussing this, there's uh, an interesting kind of pushback that people are saying, well, actually, is it ethically okay for us in, the, in, in Britain to be making this economic sacrifice and putting all these people out of work and causing all this hardship in support of a cause that isn't even our cause it's not on our soil so i think there's some very interesting again parallels yeah. about who we care about where we care about them um, and how we empathize with people as well so i think something when we think about fast fashion today is it's much easier to empathize with people who are a bit like us, who live closer to us. And I think some of those same issues are played out there as well. Um, so it's very challenging. It makes us think about them. Brilliant. Thank you. And I, I know we, we've had other comments in as well. I'm sure we'll come back to some of the other points um, as we go through. But Bethan, thank you so much. Really, really great start to, uh, to the discussion this evening. And uh, I know we'll welcome you back up to the stage uh, for some discussion after the next talk as well. Thank you very much. So I'm delighted to say our um, our second uh, speaker tonight um, has actually come a long way to be with us, even though we're virtual. Um, he's uh, flown all the way from uh, from India. We're joined by Siddhant Shah, who's a heritage architect and accessibility specialist, um, and he's joining us tonight from uh, from Belfast. Um, he is a TEDx speaker, inclusive arts-based therapist, and an UNESCO consultant on accessibility. Based usually in India, um, he's worked with museums, art galleries, and cultural sites globally to improve accessibility, focusing in particular on children as well as groups with disabilities. He was the Indian representative at the Tate Intensive 2019 at the Tate Modern, and has been invited to design an academic curriculum on inclusive cultural spaces. Um, so, uh, I can say Sidan is is expert in many many um, aspects of um, uh, kind of uh, sorry cultural history and um, and uh, and engagement more generally. I'm really really interested to hear uh, Sidan's take tonight on this topic, um, and I know in terms of his talk um, that we'll be sharing in a moment, um, he's going to be thinking particularly around some of the the early influences of cotton textiles designs and the examples of these um, which are available in the museums um, uh, in in the in the UK as well. So I think we'll see some links with, with Bethan's talk um, but I'd like to welcome Sidan up onto stage. Um, I'm really excited about your talk Sidan. 
Thanks, Matthew. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, my introduction does typically get a bit confusing because people assume that we, uh, we have one skill and we'll be working in one space, but really the, the whole idea of looking at museums, accessibility and inclusion is about that there is something to engage with, an experience that we all can take from it and what is it that we really want to understand from the museums. Based on that, I will be talking about the journey that you know an Indian textile has taken, what sort of changes it went through, and as uh, Bethan touched upon Shins, I'll be talking some more details about how did it happen with examples of museums that you can uh, look at in the UK, go to understand really what are the stories that those objects are telling us and the journey those objects have taken in various different forms. So I'm just going to, um, then my screen is up and I will be sharing details here. Thank you. So th the entire discussion is more of a photo essay in terms of the journey that a fabric takes. And it is not a journey that it's only the fabric, but multiple stories that narratives that are associated with this. And one of the trends that we are looking at is also the concept of shared heritage. And where did the, the, the object come from? What is it that it is trying to tell us and how was it acquired where did it come in into the into the collection so the peak is more into the collections that you would find in england at large and we're looking at certain museums from there particularly the the national portrait gallery looking at the victoria albert museum british museum and based on that i wanted to share that there are certain words that we assume and we look at which have been part of the discussion, like words like khaki or shawl or shins, like these are all Indian words and they have been used, they have been used as English words, but they all have their origin in India. And in order to understand that, we need to take few steps back to realize that pre-18th century, what was the situation and how was the connection, the transition of the East India Company and the India becoming more uh as a, as a factor of the, the empire rather than only a, a a country where you would bring your sources for for the purpose of trade but also coming under the governing body the whole concept here and particularly with this slide is to give you an idea that this is literally the amazon at that time like you could go through this interesting portable museum that was very interestingly put together by uh, john watson where there were samples and samples of various different types of textiles and fabrics and weaves that were available. You would have an, a, a textile which would be of a size of an A3 size sheet along with a detail that would be given. And if they were available in other multiple colors, they would be provided. And this, in a way, is the very beginning of how the textile trade would be set up because you would, based on the samples, you would give your orders and then that would be sent across for production in India at that point in time, which would be then brought in here. And what he says is very interesting, and I'm going to going to quote him. It says that it must not be thought that the taste of India takes delight in what is gaudy or glaring. Such combinations of form and color and many of these specimens, and he really calls them specimen because they were collected as specimen objects, considering them like of being having some exotic value exhibiting it and carefully calling it to be something that has a certain calmness, a quietness and a harmony where with the riot and the chaos these colors can cause. And the words that I was talking about, right, like these are all words that have their origin in, in, in India. Like we have the words that come from the Hindi words and particularly the one that I would be talking about today is the journey of shins and i'm very happy that bethin touched upon the fact that you know how this particular fabric which is uh, which is in a in a very interesting way focusing on the concept of how the journey is made how we really investigate into the fabric to understand where it comes from and this is a fabric that you see day in day out like i am also holding a bag i recently did some shopping and you can see the the continuation of a pattern that we see. And there was a question that somebody had asked Bethin about what is the continuation that we see 
And I think that the continuation, the design always evolves. And I think design is one such domain that doesn't move around in isolation. It always finds different ways of connecting with, with various different elements. And particularly here, we want to be talking about the journey of Shins, which is an English floral fabric, but it actually comes from the Hindi word that is called cheetah. The cheetah means something that is spotted. Madder, which was a root, which was used extensively in India in, with block printing and like with resist dyeing. This is something that is very typical of this particular floral fabric. With the technical process of a bamboo pen being used to create the kalamkari, which is the design, and then having the resist dyeing of the process using the red madder, which has the, the color here. But along with that, like why does it become important to talk about something in this forum and what kind of stories about cotton is it telling? Because I think fabrics, particularly from the Indian textile collection, have this very interesting mix of multiple different themes that speak about slavery, that speak about colonialism, and also about cultural appropriation. Whether they were painted or printed, if they were used in various different mediums, it becomes a part and parcel of life and how they some way just blend into the fabric of the society, making it quite comfortable, even though it was a foreign influence that came into, uh, into the UK. A lot of people assume that the influence of this particular fabric is around the late 17th and the 18th century, but actually the genesis of this particular form happens during the time of the Mughal ruler uh, Jahangir, who worked extensively with his artist Mansoor, where he had commissioned him to look at around 100 plus flowers that bloom in spring and create a harmony around that. Initially, it was only a folio of observing nature, the floral form. Later, the richness of the form gave this diversity that it could become, it literally became like the list of kind of like you could you could pick up various different floral forms, bring them together and create a, a, a pattern out of that. Recently, there was a show called The Fabrics of India at the VNA and they showed a pavilion that was designed, which was... A, a, made out of cloth with which was which would be a hunting pavilion which could be hosted and it was completely designed in this manner and it also talks about the influence of how these patterns over a period of time got more sensitized they, they were more sanitized particularly for the consumption in an english market and please feel free to take any screenshots if you want i've mentioned the the, the details of the object that is available in the museum you can put in the details and you can you can definitely look it up, which is available online. So this, there is this one particular artwork that I would like you all to see. And if you find something interesting in this artwork, and I would request you to put that observation in the chat, I will wait for a few seconds. What is it that you find interesting about this particular portrait that is put up here? This is at the National Gallery in London. But there's something distinctive that talks about how this fabric was used and if anyone like I'll wait for like five six seconds if anyone finds it interesting and like is able to spot it please feel free to put it in the options uh, of the, the chat option available here so we'll proceed further and it's actually this like if you look if you pay close attention to the the garment that's worn along with the soft furnishing that you see in the furniture this particular fab this particular fabric not only found patronage in garments but it was also mainly due to queen mary bringing this decorated material in the furnishing it was considered that that was a sophisticated way and it kind of moves there is a transition that is marked in the in the in the interior space in the furnishing space from the heavy embroidered uh, cloth work which kind of finds a transition into this painted or printed fabric which has a certain uh, uh, floral value in the in the space. So a lot of these objects that we find in museums, they have multiple narratives, they have multiple stories to tell us. It's not only one portrait, but it is multifaceted storytelling object that tells us about the, f the interior designing of that time. It speaks about the fashion of that time. And more so it talks about the importance and influence that, you know, there was a of this transdisciplinary movement of art, culture, and heritage at that point in time. 
So coming closer to like because I know I have only ten minutes. Like I'll take last two minutes to talk about this. That how did this trade grow and what was the the need? You know, with the need booming and the need increasing, it was getting extensively difficult for them to find. organizations to find institutes that could set up and create these kind of printed and painted and i'm using this word again and again because this technique involves both both uh, techniques to create this particular textile and based on the learnings that were there and as bethan mentioned they were copied and they were made in in europe their manufacturers found different ways they understood the the technique and they looked at this as an opportunity in creating this uh, in the in the european market so that it could be catered to the larger the consumption that was there at one point there was actually tax that was levied on using this fabric because the need was just rising and rising for its multifaceted use that one could wear in fashion or in in furnishing so to end my talk here i would really like to urge you all to stop and hear you know and find connections and stories that your garments have that your clothes tell you because there is a lot that we could learn from them and I'm really happy to take the discussion forward and i would really like to thank university of leeds and be curious and gim which is goa institute of management for whom we've been doing this project and i think it there are so many discussions that one could have around these topics thank you and i finish in 11 seconds 11 minutes <laughs> brilliant thank you sudan that's brilliant thank you very much and 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 please you Gave a shout out to Go Institute of Management and our good friend Professor Divya Singhal there as well. Yeah, um, I'm sure he's watching along tonight as well. Um, I thought that was fascinating. We've got some uh, questions which have come in via the chat already. So let's have a look at these. We've got one that's just come in by Ginny, and it's asking about the dress actually that we were just looking at in detail. Um, so Ginny's asking, what's the dress and lining of silk rather than cotton? Um. I would have to look into the details, but I was trying to bring the discussion about like about the the connection that that fabric found in. But yes, definitely this particular print it became a print over the period of time more than the pattern, you know, and that was then replicated in various different styles. You you find this in pashmina shawls as well, which where it is woven. So I'm sure that could have been silk. I don't I don't think so. That would be cotton at that point in time because the way it was so grand in its And its appeal, and also the rendering is quite illustrious. So it, I think so. It should be silk, but I'm not very sure. I Any feel like my depth is? already with with that uh, that bit of discussion. Right. Um. Next next question we got is from uh, Liv. Um. And it's really positive. So uh, wow, so many words that we don't know the origins of. Um. Have you noticed museums trying to highlight cultural origins of objects and their names in in recent times? Is that growing? that is growing and i'm i'm actually here on a project on a similar project by british museum where they are looking at decolonization sadly the right word is the looted objects because they came in in various different forms right but it is really interesting to see the recognition of where the history of the object is its provenance and then looking at so many different things which bring into the narrative of decolonization also making this in true way an inclusive collection so i think yes there is a process a lot and museums across uk we are also seeing where they are actually asking people that this is an object with contested history would you like to provide your suggestion and they're going out to public and and doing it fascinating I'm really really pleased to hear that as well so that that that's growing um i think this would be a really good opportunity to to ask um uh, bethan to uh, to come back onto the uh, the stage Uh, with us um and to, to join in the conversation Beth and I think you've had uh, some discussion with Vanessa ahead of tonight as well to to pick up on her thoughts on this topic I wondered if you wanted to maybe share a bit of that and 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 discuss that with Sudant Absolutely so um actually Vanessa contributed um quite a large part of the first bits that I talked about so thinking about cotton and slavery and the connections between British cotton mills um so thank you very much Vanessa for that but I think something that um that Vanessa has been really interested in thinking about is how um a lot of these products that said pass through these kind of international networks become embedded in everyday british life and i think it's really interesting the example of chintz because obviously um 
there was a, a great Ikea advert, was it in the 80s or the 90s, that was throw out your chintz. This idea that kind of chintz is this old fat fashioned British thing. And actually, it's it's not something you want to be part of. But the fact that it's become said it became sort of so embedded in this idea of how we see British design. And I think it's very interesting to ask people to kind of interrogate where that came from, but also why perhaps that history hadn't been something that had been taught to them in museums prior to this. So Siddhant mentioned um, the fascinating Fabric of India exhibition. Um, and a big part of what that did was to really try and open up the collections at the Victoria and Albert Museum to ask where they came from and who made some of those Indian fabrics. And I think it's really interesting. Um, I don't know if Siddhant's got any any thoughts on on why that's something that is currently speaking so much to British museum audiences. Why is that something we're now so interested in doing? Um, I would say there are, there are two ways of looking at it. One which would be a, an extensively political way, which I don't want to get into. But second second is the cultural aspect, and which is always the better way because it always, the focus is on the respect towards the cultural diversity, right? For the longest time, there also one very interesting thing that I'm seeing here is that, and as I'm researching, I was in, in the Ulster Fo uh, uh, American Folk Art Museum today, and they've actually started writing their captions in third person. And I think that's that's really interesting because they're like, we don't want to stand in the position of authority and command that this is what we feel. But what we want to do is that they and them, that is how they are, they are now addressing the objects because it's come from somewhere. It's not us, but and we are very happy to acknowledge the fact that we do not have authority over this. It is only that we are displaying it. We are putting intellectual scholarship around this and putting it out in public, please feel free to provide your feedback. And I think that's truly inclusive. And that is one way because the, the narratives are changing. Never before you've seen so many objects repatriated, given back, which were like part of the looting that, you know, you see with, with uh, the tribes, particularly, you know, in Nigeria, you have, uh, there are certain objects that are found. And also important to understand that some of these objects have religious significance. Some of these objects have cultural significance. So, for example, the production of shin, so like that's still in life fashion. That's it's still going on. But when you look at other other museum objects, which are like sculptures or idols or paintings, they have a completely different significance to it. And I think the narratives are changing. It has it has always been the tide, and I think the current wave that we all are all are surfing on is the one of decolonization and trying to be. Mm -hmm respectful of the fact that whatever it is, we acknowledge it and let's move ahead in a better mm. way. And and I think something that you raise really nicely there is sort of acknowledging the, the craft and the skills as well, rather than just saying, well, this is a pretty piece of fabric. Yes. I think it's really interesting to sort of see how much people are interested in going, oh, what did it take to do that? How did they know how to do that? What did that involve? Um, so yeah, I, I'm really excited about that as a, as a movement as well. So you know, particularly looking at the craft form, right? Like it's always been that unknown artist. We we really don't know who was the one like deciding it, who was the one uh, creating it and also how they were acquired, right? Under what pertex were they acquired? So that is still the case where like, like the, the first question that was asked to you, you know, it kind of answers that part also that is the relevance still there? Like we saw an influence of Indian textiles in British and like last week I was going around uh, around London and I went into a Ralph Lauren showroom just to see that the current, the, the spring design is actually a traditional Indian art form, which is Bandhani, which has been incorporated into a, a, an evening gown, which is fantastic. It is a sari that you see a, a woman wearing like extremely casually walking around in that. And suddenly that's put up on a pedestal in, in a, in a, in a showroom so there are different ways of it coming back you know and as this as i said design doesn't exist in isolation like it's constantly out there like trying to find different ways of being incorporated into a new avatar i would say it's fascinating listening to you both uh, talk about this. I'm just mindful of time. And there's a couple of questions I'd like to fire off at you, if I can do, that have come in from uh, people watching along at home. Um, so the, the first of these um, is uh, from uh, Hariati. 
um, I hope I've, I've got that right, um, asking, is there maybe um, a connection between chintz and batik? If I said that correctly, I, uh, I'm, again, I, I haven't heard of this term. So if you tell us what it is as well, I'd be really grateful. So uh, batik, uh, okay. So let's understand that these are interestingly these are these are technical processes. Okay, so batik is like typically where you you want to resist dying. So in resist dying, you don't you're resisting the dye from that particular point in that particular space. So in batik, you use something which is wax, where you would use wax and you would create your design. And then after that, the cloth is dyed and then it's put into water. And then when you when you clean it up, the, the wax comes off. So the part where the wax was there does not get dyed and the other part gets dyed. So you see a, a, a colored stain in that area. With this particular technique here, you are actually using a bamboo pen to create a pattern. Also, it's called from the word cheetah, which is spotted where the spot, the form would be there and then you are giving it a, a certain uh, line work to it. So that these are technical processes, but they are different. So the process of working on with resist over here, like say, for example, we also have something which is known as Dabu printing and Dabu printing is where you use mud to resist. And that wet mud is block printed upon the fabric and then you dye the fabric in indigo and then you use it. So I think there are very, very, very interesting ways of looking at these. Though th there are some that would find a connection. There itself is a separate technique called Kalamkari where you use a Kalam, which, is, which means a nib to create art form and use it. So again, not existing in isolation. They'll all find a connection somewhere. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'm just going to quick follow up on this one. I'm going to come to Bethan with a question. Um, so uh, Sue has just asked, um, thinking about the Burberry collection, which featured a lot of batik, there is thinking, is there, would you think that this is cultural appropriation? You know, how, how do you feel about this? What's your view? Is, Not a is strong this, sorry, view. is it? Uh... <laughs> Sorry, Sudan, sorry. Just following up on, on what you were yeah. just talking talking to us about. about Burberry collection, which fe featured a lot. Okay, so there is the, the, let's understand that some of these craft forms have been given a GI tagging, which is geographical indication tagging, and it becomes mandatory to give them the due credit, get it made in those areas, and you know, there's a very thin line between cultural appropriation and like, again, like, I'm not going to show the brand, but I'm just going to show the bag that, that you know, I don't know, where, where, like, how, at, at what point do you draw the line between a cultural appropriation or copying someone, right? Like, I may just tweak something and this could be like sold in, in a market, like uh, maybe the, the, the scarf that I'm wearing, it's it's mm -hmm. silk, which which comes from a particular area in, in Assam, up in the, in the, in that region where it's woven with white and red. Maybe somebody could pick this up and put that out as, as a neckerchief in, in various colors, but with the same pattern. But now, is that cultural appropriation or not? We don't know, but somebody could say that I'm just inspired by it. So that that there is this whole definition and Bethin could, could talk, maybe elaborate more on that, you know, in fashion, that, that word inspiration is a double-edged word, you know, like you really don't know. Inspiration, to, appropriation, uh, yeah. yes. Thank you. And, and just so um, a final final question to um, to Bethan, if I can do. And this one came in from uh, Ruth. Uh, so Ruth was saying, I was interested in the comment that you made about the reuse of cotton clothes. Um, can you say more about this? And I guess, at what point did we stop doing that? And, and did the economics change? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and a lot of the examples I've talked about today you can see cotton reuse. So um, a number of the chintz pieces that the Victoria and Albert Museum have are actually remade chintz. So chintz as a fabric, especially Indian chintz, and um, that's an imported fabric, was really valued. Um, and it's often remade into other dresses. It's then sometimes remade again into children's clothes because you can cut it down smaller. Um, and there was actually a fashion uh, uh, during parts of the 18th century for patchwork children's clothes made out of different bits of chintz when you end up with really small pieces. But you also see, even when you get into the 1950s, Horrocks's cottons, again, are very prized and are often cut down to be made into children's clothes because the brightly colored printed cottons are really prized. Um, 
And that's actually pretty common practice up until you get into the 1970s, 1980s, when um, it's, it's to do with the value of fabric. Basically, when fabric becomes cheap enough that it's not worth going to the effort, that's when that practice falls out. But yeah, sort of in those earlier periods, the cotton is really valuable. I know we think of it as a really cheap fabric now, but it was really prized and really valuable. I guess there's a lesson in there in terms of maybe how our, our, our thinking and, and value put on these resources needs to change. I'm going to say, I think there's one final comment. I think a, a really nice point to leave this discussion on, um, which came from Liv. And I think it's a lovely, lovely comment to, to finish up on. So uh, Liv says, I'm inspired to go through my wardrobe and find out where the names of styles and fabrics came from. Thanks. And I think that's a really ni nice way of, uh, of expressing, I think, um, what probably many of us will have done, which is learn uh, through the talks you shared today. And um, I've learned at least four techniques and at least six terms, I think I noted down as you're both talking. Um, so um, I, I apologize at home if we didn't get a chance to uh, pick up on your question or your comment, but thank you so much for the um, for the interaction and, and the, the discussion that I can see in the in the chat box. Really appreciate it. So with that, that brings tonight's event to a close. So I'd like to say um, very much a, a big thank you to, to both our brilliant speakers, Bethan and Sidan. Really appreciate um, your talks and, and um, your, your kind of responses and discussion, and also to Vanessa as well for feeding into this. So thank you both so much. Uh, and then thank you. Sorry, I, I just wanted to say that there, there is a if anybody was interested to learn more about the technique, like Victoria and Albert Museum, as part of their outreach, did a lot of blogs on the Fabric of India show. And if you just Google it, you will find various different blogs that talk about the fabric, its history, the, even and some of them have actually created what are the contemporary ways of creating those fabrics, showing those videos as well. Brilliant. So you've got homework as well. If you're interested in this, <laughs> Sudant has now set you homework um, and resources to check out. Thank you, Sudant. So with that, thank you so much um, for joining us at home and sending in your questions to the speakers. As I said, we've had some great discussion going on in, in, the, um, in the comments area. We really hope you enjoyed tonight's event. Um, and if you did, why not let us know by tweeting us? And you can tweet us at UniLeadsEngage and also by using the hashtag, hashtag BeCuriousLates. Now, we'd really welcome your feedback on tonight's event. So please let us know what you thought by filling in the short evaluation form uh, available at the link, which we'll share in the chat. Those of you who booked the session will also receive an email with the link to the evaluation form tomorrow. I, can't, you, I bet you can't wait to see that fly into your inbox as well. Um, if you enjoy tonight, why not join us for our next Be Curious Lates event, Cotton's Hidden Voices, the second in our Cotton series, which is due to be held on Wednesday, the 25th of May. You can register for your free ticket now via the link in the chat. But that's it from us for now. Have a great evening. Thanks very much for joining us. And goodbye from Leeds.